Okay, so now we're finally ready to tackle the problem of the potential step. So the way that we're going to formulate this problem is essentially you can imagine that you have a, a potential that has a finite value of zero all the way from x is less than zero. And then once it hits the origin, the potential is basically stepped up very abruptly to v naught. So v naught is a finite value, it's a constant value. And it is going to be the value of the potential for x greater than zero. So basically this potential is going to extend to infinity on both sides. Now, this is going to complicate matters for us a little bit because this means that our wave function is no longer going to be confined. So the best way that we can think about this problem is by having some kind of incident wave. So imagine that our particle is traveling from the left in this direction. And then once it hits the barrier, it will do something very interesting. So as you may imagine, part of that wave function or that probability amplitude is going to get reflected back in the opposite direction. And then another part of it is going to get transmitted through this particular potential. Now, we're going to prove how this actually works. So it really depends on the energy that the particle has. This, obviously, you can imagine that if this potential represents something like a wall and our particle is something like a ball, then what's going to happen is the ball is going to bounce off the wall and then it's going to get reflected back. So it makes no sense to have any probability that it would actually exist uh, across this kind of potential. But we'll prove that mathematically. So the first thing we're going to do is formulate the problem. So to formulate any quantum mechanics problem, we start by writing the Schrodinger equation. And here we have to notice one very simple thing. So we're going to have two regions. This is going to be region 1 and this is going to be region 2. So unlike most of the problems we have dealt with in the past, we are going to have a different solution to the Schrodinger equation depending on which region we're on. So for the first region, the Schrodinger equation is going to look like this. We're going to have our term h bar square over 2m times the second derivative of the wave function. And now in this region, we know that the potential is zero, so that means that our Schrodinger equation is going to be written in this way. And now to differentiate it from the solution on the second region, I'm just going to use the subscript 1. Now we know what the solution to this is going to look like. We can rewrite this equation in the following manner. So we're going to have psi 1 double prime x plus k1 squared psi 1 equals to 0. And because this is going to have complex roots, our solution is going to look like this. So this is going to be psi of x. This is psi 1 of x equals to some constant a times e to the power of i um, our constant is k1 x plus b e to the minus i k1 x where k1 is essentially equal to the square root of 2m times the energy over h bar squared and now you might be wondering why are we writing the equation in this form because so far, when we have complex roots and a second order differential equation, we have written this in terms of cosines and sines. So why not write it that way? Well, the reason we don't do that is because we want to shed a light on the kind of physics that is going on here. And this particular representation of the solution is qu quite interesting because you will notice that this term right here, if you look at the way that it is written, this complex exponential represents a wave propagating towards the right and this part here represents a wave propagating towards the left so basically this is a backwards propagating wave the really interesting thing here is that we know that this here will correspond to the incident wave so this is basically going to be the incident wave this will be the amplitude of that incident wave so we can actually choose a to be anything we want we can easily say that a equals to 1 just to assume that the initial incident wave is normalized and that is not really going to change the physics of this problem so we can make this sim this simplification here now notice what is going to happen with this term we're going to have a backwards propagating wave that has an amplitude of p so how about we call that amplitude something like r 
So R is going to stand for reflection coefficient. And you can imagine that the amplitude is going to be based on how much of this incident wave is going to get reflected once it hits this interface here. So we can actually write our equation in the following form. We're going to have EIK1X plus RE minus IK1X. So that's it. We just actually found two constants two arbitrary constants simply by using some physical reasoning. We didn't have to apply any boundary conditions to find this. We chose it for the problem at hand. Now to find this actual coefficient we will need to do some more stuff but before we do that we need to define the function in the second region. So now we're going to have the following. The Schrodinger equation in the second region is going to be the follows, as, uh, it's going to be written as follows. Now we know the potential is going to have a finite value, a non-zero value of v naught. So we need to include that here into the Schrodinger equation. There's just no way around it. And this is going to have a very interesting effect on our solution. Because we can essentially write this in the following way. We can write psi double prime 2x plus k2 squared psi 2x equals to zero if we make k2 equals to the square root of 2m times e to the minus v naught over h bar squared and you might notice that this is actually going to be a little bit more complicated to analyze because as you can see from here the energy of the particle is actually going to affect its behavior in this second region so we're going to have to analyze the behavior of the of the particle based on three cases. We have the case in which the energy is greater than the potential, the case in which the energy is less than the potential, and the case in which the energy is equal to the potential. So that's something that we'll do as well. Now, before we move on to analyzing those three cases, I want to write the general solution to this equation here in the following way. We're going to have some other constant c e to the i k 2 x plus some other constant d e to the minus i k 2 x. And you'll notice something very peculiar about this. This once again represents a forwards propagating wave and this represents a backwards propagating wave. So let's look at the problem at hand once again. If we assume that part of this incident wave gets transmitted through the potential step, then do we really have any backwards propagating wave here? Because in essence, to have something back, uh, propagating backwards from here, we would need something to get reflected here. But we know that this potential is just going to stay constant at the value of v0 to infinity. So there's never going to be another interface from which this is going to get reflected. So the only logical solution to this problem here is to make the constant d equals to zero. Because there is no way from a physical point of view that we can have a backwards propagating wave inside that potential or basically for x is greater than zero. And the other thing that we can say is well if this is going to be the transmitted wave then why don't we just call c something like the transmission coefficient such that conservation of energy is retained. We're going to have incident energy plus reflected energy equals to transmitted energy. So we can rewrite our solution in the following way. We can write T e to the i k 2 x. And this is basically it. So now we have the solution for both regions and now all we need to do to solve this is to actually just find boundary conditions. So that is basically what we're going to do now. We're going to find out what the boundary conditions are going to be. So let me just make some room for that. And let's clean this space here. Okay, so let's see what the boundary conditions will be. Well, we need to think about this more critically than before because they're not going to be so obvious. Now, the boundary conditions will be given by this interface here. We know that there needs to be conservation of energy. 
So that means that our waves essentially at this point is going to be equal to the wave at this point. And this is not because of conservation, but rather because of continuity of the function. Remember, if we have a continuous function, imagine that this is our wave coming in here, and then it happens to change its form here. Well, the, the wave kind of just abruptly just jump here and then start here. We need to have continuity, so this point has to be connected with this. So the value of the function needs to be the same for both of them at this point in which they're t um, both connected. This is just a, a physical kind of condition that we need to meet. Otherwise, it just wouldn't make sense. What actually happened to the wave here, we wouldn't be able to explain that. So we need to make this condition. Now, the next condition is going to be, well, imagine that your wave is coming in this way and then it changes to something else. What you notice here is that the gradient needs to be the same for both because it is essentially the same point. So from that analysis, we can conclude that the first derivative at the point x equals to zero needs to be the same for both of these. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make those equal and we're going to solve for the constants r and t. So let's start with the first equation. So the first equation is going to give us the following. We're going to have e to the i k1 0 plus r e to the i k1 0 equals to t e to the i k1 0. Now this is going to become 1, this is going to be 1, and this is going to be 1. So in the end we can write this equation in the form 1 plus r equals to t. And you'll notice that, well, that sort of makes sense because we expect reflectance and transmittance to add up to 1 because there are no losses in the system. So conservation of energy tells you that they should actually be the same. Now, obviously, there might be an incons inconsistency in the way that we define the sign here because, obviously, when we add up transmittance and reflectance, we should get 1. But this, remember, these are coefficients, not necessarily the total reflectance and transmittance. So this is something that we'll have to investigate a little bit later on. Now that's what the first equation gives us. And now the second equation is going to give us the following. The first equation is going to differentiate into the following. E i k 1 0 and then this is going to be, remember this is minus here. So this now is going to be minus i k1 r to, uh, times e to the minus i k1 0 equals to i k2 I forget that this was a k2 here t e to the i k2 0 so this is 1 this is 1 and this is 1 again and now what we're left with is well the, the i's are just gonna cancel out so we can get rid of those we're gonna be left with k1 minus k1 r equals to k2 times t and if we solve for t, so basically just input this in here we're gonna get 1 plus r times k2 and then if we expand this, this becomes k2 plus k2r and now we just rearrange to solve for r on both sides so this implies that r is going to have the following value k1 minus k2 over k1 plus k2 and then t is just going to be 2k1 over k1 plus k2 and this is basically what we're going to get for reflection and transmission coefficients now in the next video we're actually going to go a little bit further than this even though this is technically solved we need to investigate what happens physically when the energy of the particle shifts uh, about the constant value that the potential step has and we're also going to find out how to calculate the total reflectance and transmittance of this system based on these two quantities.